So at ReactJSConf last January, we introduced the idea of GraphQL. Today, we're going to explore more of GraphQL, its core principles, and why it's powerful. But first, I want to start with the story of where GraphQL came from. Our story start, starts more than four years ago, in 2011, when Facebook got serious about mobile. In 2011, Facebook revolved around the web. The web is part of Facebook's DNA. It's something that we deeply understand, and we have a lot of skill in it. And Facebook was, and in many ways still is, architected to support the web. So here's a high-level view of what Facebook's architecture looked like at the time. Our web server is responsible for receiving requests from our browser, fetching data from our databases and services, generating UIs in the form of HTML, and delivering those for rendering by the browser. So while we had iOS and Android apps, the teams working on these were really small. The apps could only do a small portion of what you could do on the website, and they were falling further behind. As on the web, Facebook was rapidly expanding and evolving its capabilities. So if we were going to be serious about mobile, we needed a way to quickly catch up to the rapid pace of the rest of Facebook. So we chose a mobile architecture that allowed us to reuse as much of Facebook's existing code as possible. Our native apps were simply mobile web browsers wrapped in a native frame that visited a slightly customized version of Facebook's mobile website. This allowed us to reuse all of the work going into our web server and didn't change how engineers at Facebook were used to building things. For our primary goal of supporting all of Facebook on mobile, this was a resounding success. We were able to develop a considerable surface area of Facebook for mobile devices in well under a year, and we succeeded in shifting the company's focus and attention to mobile. But there were some issues. As our mobile apps became more sophisticated, we started employing larger images, videos, and rich animations and gestures. Mobile web browsers, they just couldn't keep up. At best, we had poor frame rate. And more often than not, the mobile web browser, it would just simply consume all available memory and crash our app. So while Apple originally released iOS with the web browser as the primary tool for app developers, it was pretty clear that mobile web was not their priority when new versions of iOS would be released without fixing bugs or improving performance of their web stack. Android's browsers were even more problematic. So in the beginning of 2012, we started an effort to develop truly native implementations of Newsfeed, the most important piece of Facebook and the first thing that you see when you open our app. So while this might sound like an obvious thing to do, it was a far from modest undertaking. For the first time, our client side was doing a lot of work. It didn't speak in terms of page URLs and HTML, but instead in terms of models and views. And it required us to rethink our architectural stack. So in order to serve the native apps the data that they needed to fill their models and render their views, we had to figure out how to request, prepare, and deliver that data from our existing servers, which up until that point had been designed to only deliver HTML. So we tried a few approaches. We started with our RESTful public API. And as we went down this path, we realized that we were writing a ton of client code to deal with the network. We had to coordinate multiple requests to get all the information that we needed to render the app, which could result in a lot of expensive round trips. Also, each request had a slightly different response shape, and not the shape that we wanted to use as the model in our app, so there was also a lot of custom parsing logic. And at the time, you know, the REST API it was designed with a different audience in mind, with different goals in mind. It queries individual resources, and it's really good at that. But we needed to look for something more structured. So FQL, it's pa Facebook's public API, exposed using a variant of the SQL language. FQL, it's a really powerful tool. It exposes data in a structured way, and for a while, this met our needs. But few of us could really understand the really complicated multi-join queries required to get all the necessary information to render our app. And we frequently made mistakes, and maintaining this thing was pretty hard. And we realized that beyond any surface level issues, what we really didn't like about these approaches is that they didn't present data in the same way that we think about data. We don't think about our data in terms of joint tables, secondary keys, or resource URLs. We think about our data in terms of objects, properties, and relationships. We think about our data as a graph. Most importantly, we think about it in terms of the client models we ultimately use within our apps, whether that's JSON or NS objects. So with this in mind, a few of us started building what would become GraphQL. 
as a way of expressing the needs of our native apps in terms of how our product designers and developers actually think about the underlying data. And this seemed to work. A couple months later, GraphQL was powering a newly built native newsfeed. And the first iOS app powered by GraphQL hit the App Store almost exactly three years ago today. And GraphQL, it now delivers data to over 1,000 active versions of our mobile apps and serves over 260 billion requests per day. This new architectural stack powered by GraphQL, it's become the primary way that we build mobile applications and the servers that power them at Facebook, and we've continued to evolve GraphQL. And later today, Joe Savona is going to tell you about Relay, which is a library that brings a lot of what we've learned from using GraphQL in our native applications back to the web, which brings this whole thing full circle. So let's take a look at GraphQL and see how it feels to use it. This is the hello world of GraphQL queries. I want to query my name. So the first thing you'll notice is that this looks pretty similar to JSON. We have these curly braces that look like objects, and we call these selection sets. And Within those are some things that look a little bit like object keys. We call these fields. Fields can themselves have selection sets, which allows us to describe nested requests. When we send this query as a string to a GraphQL server, it gets parsed and executed. And the response looks something like this, as JSON. You can see that the response and the query have really the same structure. And this is an important part of why GraphQL is easy to learn and use. A GraphQL query describes the shape of the resulting data. Here, the name field is a property of my user object on Facebook. But what exactly is me field a property of? The top level of GraphQL query, it re represents all the capabilities that GraphQL can do, um, more or less all the data. Since a graph has no starting point, no middle, no end, the fields that it offers at the top level provide various points of access at which point you can start a request. So in this example, me gets back my Facebook user object, and I can start from there. Uh, but this doesn't have to be the only way. Here's another more programmatic way to access my user object, um, or anyone else for that matter. And this pattern of looking things up by ID, it's pretty common in GraphQL, you know, for the same reasons it's common in other query systems. Um, and here, ID is a field argument. So providing field arguments, it causes fields to behave slightly differently. We can change their behavior. You can kind of think about fields like functions that return values. And you know, sometimes functions need arguments. We can also request fields that have complicated values, complex values. Here, profile picture, it's a complex field. It has some information about width and height and uh, a URL to load the image. And I bet you can already guess what the response is going to look like since GraphQL describes the shape of the resulting data. So in GraphQL, you have to specify fields in your query all the way down to scalar leaf values. And in this example, width, height, and URL are all scalars, numbers and strings. This ensures that there's no ambiguity in the information that is needed by your app, and there's no over or under fetching. And the result is always predictable by the query itself. So at Facebook, profile pictures come in a lot of sizes. While the default profile picture might be 50 pixels, uh, we can request one of a specific size. So again, we're using a field argument, and that changes the field's behavior. And it results in a slightly different size profile picture in the result. But what if we wanted the same picture in multiple sizes? Well, we can request the same field multiple times by using aliases. Aliases allowed for a field that the server knows about to be returned in the resulting JSON, but with a different key. So in this case, we can fetch you know, big pick and little pick that are both the profile picture field, but because we've used aliases, they can come back in the resulting JSON with those keys, letting us request the same field two times. But most importantly, GraphQL is designed not just to query the properties of one object, but smoothly follow connections between them. For example, I can query not just my name, but also the names of all of my friends. So notice, here's where SQL would require a join table or where a REST API would expose IDs or URLs to follow in a second round trip. GraphQL allows you to naturally request this in a single query. Also notice that the fields that requested on friends apply to every friend in the list, which makes this nice for requesting lists of things. And you can do this as deeply as is necessary for the application you're building. So if I wanted to get not just my name and my friends' names, but the names of the events that my friends are attending, um, I can continue to naturally query at deeper levels. 
And since I might want to trade off between having all of this information and the amount of time that it might take to load that, I can express some constraints and limitations to the server by using field arguments. So in this case, order by and first allow me to shorten how much stuff I get. Um, and this is also the basis for paginating through larger lists. So that's how we speak GraphQL. There are a handful of core principles that really make GraphQL a powerful utility. I want to talk about those. The GraphQL language, it's powerful because it models data requirements in the same way that product designers and developers actually think about and use data. It's easy to imagine what the resulting data is going to look like just by looking at a query. And it's pretty easy to write a query if you know what data that you need. And yet, GraphQL, it's a lot more than just this language. At the core of GraphQL is a type system, which you define, that expresses all of the capabilities of your server. At each level in a GraphQL query, a particular type applies. It describes what fields are available, what arguments can be supplied to each field, and what type will result from requesting that field. So here are the types that we used in the previous examples. Um, and we're going to look at them in terms of a query. This is a lot to consume on one slide. So here's one of the queries we looked at before. We're going to get my name, a profile picture, and it's with height and URL, um, one of my friends, their name, uh, and the name of the next event that they're attending. So we're going to stop at the, start at the top. And here's the two fields that we've encountered already, me and user, both of which return a user type. And here we're requesting the me field. So me returns a user. So now we can ask for fields described by the user type. The type system, it doesn't just describe fields, but field arguments as well. Um, and in this case, the order by argument accepts one of three possible values described here by the friend order enum. And this is an example of GraphQL describing not just what's possible, but what isn't possible. You know, if a list ordering is too expensive, then it's just not exposed. And orderings don't have to be fields. So this importance heuristic that we're using, it's not a field on user. It's just a heuristic to sort them. Profile picture returns a profile picture type. Width and height are integers, and the URL is a string. And uh, friends returns a list of users. So you can see here, we're representing a list of things using these square braces in, in the type signature. Um, and then here, we're going to request uh, the events. And events itself is a list, but of event objects. And then within events, we can get the name of the event. And because we know what type is being queried at every level of the query, we can ensure that only correct queries can be requested. And this is really powerful. So in typical applications, an app server owns the model data, while the clients own the views. A client will ask for some model, usually by giving an ID, and the server can respond with the data for that model. But this produces a coupling, right, where any change made to a client view can result in a similar change being required in the app server. And it keeps these two in sync, and that can make maintaining historical versions really hard. When using GraphQL, a server expresses the complete set of possibilities that it can fill via the type system. And that allows clients to precisely express their data needs in terms of a specific query based on those types, a data shape in one single request. This separation of concerns, it allows for a single server to support a wide array of clients with really different needs, because the server actually knows less about the clients. And more importantly, it supports the continual evolution of those clients over time. So when a client developer changes how their app works, they often don't need to touch a server at all. So at Facebook, this allows us to support dozens of apps across many platforms, iOS, Android, web, and more. But not only that, it allows us to continue to support every past version of these apps with minimal technical debt on our servers. Many of our applications at Facebook release new versions to the App Store on a weekly basis, each with slightly different data characteristics than the week before. And yet, we still support that first version of Native's newsfeed that we launched just about three years ago, even though it's kind of hard to believe that people are still using it. Um, and we've released now around 1,000 different versions of our various applications. And they all use the exact same version of our GraphQL server. So we've been able to escape the whole versioning problem. So the type system, it's critical to GraphQL servers' flexibility and safety in executing queries, but we wanted to give clients of GraphQL the same power. We wanted them to have access to this type system. But we needed a way to get the type system from the GraphQL server to our clients to be able to take advantage. 
if only we had some way to query information from a server in a structured way. Yeah, that's right. We can expose GraphQL's type system via GraphQL itself. At the top, there's a special field called schema. It allows us to request a description of the type system itself, which tells us what a GraphQL server is capable of, what it can do. We call this introspection, and it presents us with an extremely powerful tool for building tools. And here's just a couple examples, definitely not uh, all of the examples, of what we can do with that. We can statically verify that a query is correct before we actually submit it. So we call this query validation. Um, and the ability to do this, it helps us find entire categories of bugs while we're writing the query, rather than finding out when we later run it. And using this tool along with some commit hooks, um, we've now ensured that bad queries can never even be committed to a repository. We can also generate code that you would otherwise have to write manually. So given a query, because we can know the exact shape of what the server is going to respond with, we can automatically generate really fast custom parsers and strongly typed native model objects or even flow types. And knowledge of this type system, it allows IDEs to go beyond simply highlighting syntax. We can present context-sensitive type aheads and we can do real-time error detection in the IDE. And this has huge implications on the productivity and sanity of client application developers. Like, that's all of us in this room. And then API documentation. So how many of you have ever experienced API documentation either being out of date with the implementation or just having, like, big gaps of missing docs? Yeah? Everyone's hand, I hope. Um, it's super frustrating. It makes it really hard to get your job done. So one of the pieces of information that introspection exposes is description. It's just a little bit of markdown formatted text that you can provide for every type, every field on every type, and every argument to every field. And because the descriptions are actually part of defining the type system, it's really easy to keep them up to date. And because we can access these descriptions from introspection, it's really easy to build tools that can generate good documentation for us. So the last powerful principle I want to talk about is composition. So GraphQL is designed with composition in mind. Every level of a query appears in a similar style, which makes assembling those queries really easy, and it matches the result. However, to match how client developers think about their UIs and to allow for pieces of a query to be reused and repeated, GraphQL has this language feature called fragments. Fragments allow for the same portion of a query to be used in multiple places. Uh, but more importantly, it allows for a UI component to describe only the data that it needs. For example, here we have a profile picture React component. And you can see in the render function here, it's doing a pretty simple things, just rendering an image tag. But in order to do that, we need the profile picture of some user. Um, and then we need the width and the height to render the image tag, and then the URL to go load. And we can define a query fragment that specifies exactly that information and nothing more. And that lets us compose. So you know, now we're going to make um, a more complicated UI component. We've called this person row. And person row needs to know the name of the person um, and then whether or not we're friends with them so we can figure out if we want to put this add friend button there. Um, and it's also going to use the profile picture component. So rather than specifying all the data that this thing needs in addition to all the data that its children needs, it specifies all the data that it needs directly, as well as referencing the fragment of the nested component. So this, it's the same compositional technique that makes building UIs with React so pleasant. And it's the same pattern that we can apply to data requirements. When we're building large, complicated applications, coupling the data requirements to the UIs that use them allows for fields to be added or removed with a lot of confidence. And it makes it really easy to avoid overfetching or underfetching. Finally, GraphQL is backed by your code, not by some predefined storage. So when we first put GraphQL to use in Newsfeed in 2012, we already had this custom, sophisticated ranking and storage model. And changing that was a complete non-starter. In addition to that, we had data about our users, you know, the authors of Newsfeed stories, uh, which came from a totally different database. Finally, we had this cache layer that had information about images, link shares, um, and other things. We couldn't make any assumptions about storage. We instead had to focus on ways to tie all of these unrelated stores together in a unifying way. And at Facebook, we also had tons of existing business logic in our code base. We really couldn't repeat that. In order for GraphQL to be widely useful, it had to easily reuse as much of this existing application code as possibly could. 
So GraphQL was designed in a way that took advantage of all of this existing work. One of GraphQL's most powerful properties is that it is not a storage engine. GraphQL makes almost no assumptions about how you'll actually access the data and instead leverages your existing application code, which means you get to keep all your code. And this is a critical part of why we were able to roll out GraphQL so quickly back in 2012. We had to change very little about how Newsfeed actually worked on the server to be able to use GraphQL. So here's how that works. Server-side application developers describe GraphQL types as a list of fields where each field is provided a function. So let's check this out in terms of the user type. Uh, we're describing a couple fields here, name, profile picture, and friends. Each field is just a function. It takes the value of the parent field as its input, and it produces a new value as its output. Because it's a function, you can do anything that your server is capable of doing to prepare the result. You can do simple things like just read properties of the previous values. You can, of course, call other functions, which means you can load from various databases. You can produce derived data that's maybe too complicated for clients to do themselves. And field functions can be asynchronous. They can return promises or arrays of promises. In fact, this is actually really common. And GraphQL will fulfill a query using as much parallelism as possible which is way less error prone and often actually more efficient than manually chaining together promises. At the very least, it's just way more pleasant to write code this way. And GraphQL is not a read-only system. It also allows writes. But GraphQL writes, they don't work the same way as many RESTful or immutable client models do. Uh, GraphQL is inspired by the Flux programming model. And GraphQL mutations are expressed as a collection of top-level actions in the form of fields. And these mutation fields can be backed by any function, an arbitrary function, which means they can integrate with any kind of existing service you have, whether that's application code, any kind of backing data, logging, more, combinations of these things, whatever. Tomorrow, my teammates, Nick and Dan, they're gonna go into a lot more depth on some of these topics as they explain how to design and build a GraphQL server. So that's GraphQL. What started as a tool for us to build a great native version of Newsfeed has grown to be a critical part of how we build almost all of our applications. And soon, as Joe Savona is gonna tell you later today, how we build for the web. GraphQL lets us decouple how we build our servers from how we build our client apps. It lets our service, server focus on expressing what's possible in the form of a type system, and it lets our client apps focus on specifying their requirements using a language that favors composition and fits the mental model of product designers and developers. Finally, via introspection, we can build powerful tools for using GraphQL. So at ReactJSConf last January, while talking about our work on Relay, we shared the idea of GraphQL publicly for the first time, despite us having used this for three years. And honestly, we were completely blown away by the excitement and demand for something like GraphQL from this community. We love using GraphQL at Facebook, but we really didn't know if it was gonna be valuable elsewhere. But after the response that we got from you guys, we knew we had to find a way to get GraphQL to you. When we first built GraphQL for Newsfeed three years ago, we had no idea how critical it was gonna to become to how we build stuff at Facebook, or had no idea that it could ever be used outside of Facebook. When we built it first, we built it really quickly, and we built it in a way that was pretty tightly tied to how Facebook works internally. And over the last few years, you know, GraphQL has continued to evolve, but most of the quirks, the inconsistencies, and almost all of the assumptions that we started with, they're still there, and it makes sharing GraphQL outside of Facebook a real challenge. So since January, inspired by your enthusiasm, Nick, Dan, and I, along with a handful of our coworkers, have been busy on a project to evaluate every detail of GraphQL, making improvements, fixing inconsistencies, and writing a specification that describes GraphQL and how it works. Well, that work's continuing, but we're at the point where we can start to share what we're working on. So today, I'm really excited to share with you that we have a working draft of the spec that is now public. We really hope that this helps those of you who are excited to build versions of GraphQL for your own servers. And we're really looking for your feedback as we continue the work to improve and refine GraphQL. But we also wanted to give you something more concrete that you could actually start to play with. 
Um, so we built a second implementation of GraphQL as a reference for server implementers that complies with our spec. And I think you'll be happy to know that we built this in JavaScript. So we chose JavaScript not just because we like it, um, but because the same source can be used by a lot of people, and especially this community, for both building GraphQL servers as well as beginning the work to build a lot of shared client-side tools. And there's still a ton of work that needs to be done, um, but today we're opening this up on GitHub as a technical preview for those of you who are interested in building GraphQL servers and building client-side tools for GraphQL. And you know, as a resource for those of you who want to build GraphQL implementations in other languages or environments and would love to look at an existing implementation uh, to base your work off of. So we're looking forward to building tools for clients of GraphQL in the future and continuing to improve GraphQL.js. So our work is definitely far from done here, um, but we're really excited. You know, we see GraphQL as a common way to describe and request information, regardless of the language or environment that your backend servers are using, or the language environment that your client applications are built in. And we're really excited to start building a community around GraphQL, and we're truly looking forward to seeing what we can build together. So thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. No questions now, but come find me later.